Welcome to the first CEOs Analysis Ready Data webinar. I am Zoltan Santoy, co-chair of the Land Surface Imaging Virtual Constellation within CEOs on behalf of the European Commission. I will say a little more about CEOs in a minute, but before that, let me start with a brief introduction. What is this webinar about? Thank you. So the objectives of this introductory webinar are to establish dialogue between CEOs and the broader geospatial community on the topic of ARD, and further to introduce the CEOs ARD for land framework and CEOs ARD strategy. We will have subsequent webinars where we will look into more details and aspects of ARD and future data architectures. But for today, we will be rather general and prioritize on questions and answers. Thank you. A little bit of an overview. I would like to, first of all, I would like to welcome everyone, not only by the presenters today, but by the entire LSI VC and CEOs. Today, we will have four short presentations, a CEOs introduction, as promised earlier, um, setting the stage, why CEOs ARD by Adam Lewis from Geoscience Australia, the CEOs analysis ready data for land framework and status by Andrea Sicuera, also from Geoscience Australia, and the implication for the community by Steve Laban from United States Geological Survey. After these, we will have about 40 minutes for questions and answers. Thank you. Now a little more about how the questions and answers session will work. I think you already received an email from, from Matt, uh, but if you missed it, please go uh, to the below web address, https www.slide.do, enter the event code, COCARD. This can be capital or small case, I think it doesn't matter. The best if you join it with your full name and organization, as in that way we will know who they are when uh, answering the questions in real time after the presentations. In the 40 minute session, we will, if, if we will not be able to cover all the questions, then we will follow up uh, through emails. Also, please keep in mind that your questions will help us to shape the next webinar. So please go ahead and send questions during the talk or after the talks. Thanks. Now, as promised, few words about the Committee on Earth Observation Satellites now. So CEOS was established under the aegis of the G7 summit back in 1984. The main function of CEOS is to coordinate and harmonize Earth observation to help the user community to access and use such data, but also helps, for example, in calibration and validation activities among its agencies. Just to see some numbers about CEOS, there are over 60 member agencies from 34 countries with about 180 active missions. And these missions are generally using over 660 instruments. As one can imagine, the coordination among all these organizations is not simple. Thus, there are five working groups and seven virtual constellations to support this work from where the land surface imaging is one of the virtual constellation. To move towards CART 4 l CEOS identified the need for a, a harmonization process to have a maximum impact of the data its agencies provide. So based on this recognition, the LSIVC started to work on the CART 4 l topic, which Adam will talk about in the next presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Zolti, and hi, everybody. Uh, it's great to have such interest in this webinar. My name's Adam Lewis. I'm from Geoscience Australia, although I work on the Digital Earth Africa establishment team. I'm one of the co-leads of CEOS's land surface imaging team. I also, for now, co-chair the CEOS strategic implementation team. Uh, my task here in the next couple of slides is to give you the rationale that led CEOS to begin work on analysis-ready data for land. Thanks, Steve. 
this this slide there are two points i want to make about this slide uh, one is we needed to define the term ard because as such it can be anything to anybody so in CIOS we defined ARD in 2016 and we defined it using the following words that CIOS ARD are satellite data that have been processed to a minimum set of requirements and organized into a form that allows more or less immediate analysis with a minimum of additional user effort and interoperability both through time and with other data sets the work in CIOS was initially led by the land surface imaging team, as Zolta has said, or LSI. Uh, and I want to emphasize that that includes members from over 12 space agencies and over a period of several years. And more than that, a much wider community of experts in remote sensing, including in passive reflection, thermal, uh, passive thermal radar, and, and more recently space LIDAR, have been involved in groups working on the technical detail. Now is the I'll leave that. Uh, next slide, please, Steve. So there were three drivers for analysis ready data, three reasons why we thought this is a really important thing to pursue, and they're all interconnected. The first one was big data. And the, the exponential increase in data flow that we are seeing now means that it's inefficient to be re repeating any unnecessary processing, including pre-processing. And it's also impossible to process even a fraction of the data in bespoke ways, which is what we used to do. Uh, so specialized pre-processing is becoming a thing of the past. Uh, more than ever before, we think that users need to be able to engage with data, not with the pre-processing of data. The second reason is that the science had advanced pretty rapidly to being focused largely on time series analysis. And scientifically, we now know how much information lies in the time series of observations. But to use a time series, you have to be able to compare the data through time. You have to know that if a data value changes, that change is likely to be due to a change on the ground or in the water, not to the vagary of a way in which the data have been processed. And the third reason is that systems need to be operational. And the new capabilities in land observation mean that these can become operational. We have the density of observations and the surety. But to be operational, you have to also be able to plan beyond one sensor. The data from different sensors of the same family or general type will have to be interleaved or cross calibrated or used to produce the one product that will endure through time. Next slide, please, Steve. So the broad solution to those problems is to move land surface imaging from being top of the atmosphere to being land surface and to move from image analysis, which is essentially an empirical search for patterns in an image, to regarding each pixel as a measurement of the land surface. And that measurement should then be quality assured and corrected for known and controllable sources of error. And that's really the journey we're on now. Uh, progress is really good. The teams working on this have identified a number of such measurements, including the four mentioned on this slide, uh, and specifications have been developed and data are starting to be produced according to those specifications. Um, we haven't excelled uh, and perhaps have lagged in terms of engaging with an audience beyond CIOS, especially the commercial sector. And it's really exciting to have such interest in this webinar because that's what we're trying to do here. The next speaker, Andrea, will go through the CIOS framework itself in a bit more detail. Thanks, Steve. Thank you, Adam, and welcome, everyone. My name is Andrea Siqueira from Geoscience Australia, and I will be presenting today an overview on the COS ARD framework, the COS ARD strategy, and the roadmap. And to finalize, I will show some COS ARD product examples. Thank you, Steve. So, um, the SEALS Analysis Ready Data Framework has three elements. Uh, the definition, which Adam um, already talked about in his presentation. The product family specifications, uh, which are technical documents and provide details on what type of corrections the data providers need to do in order to deliver analysis-ready data to their user community. 
Initially, uh, three PFSs were created and endorsed, the surface reflectance, surface temperature, and the normalized radar backscatter. And more recently, a new PFS for polar polarimetric radar was endorsed by the LSIVC community. There are also other PFSs under development, which are mainly driven by user needs. And the last part of the framework is the product alignment assessment process, which has two steps to it. Uh, the first one is the self-assessment process, which is a process where data providers self-assess their products using the specifications to understand how well their products meet the SEUS ARD specifications and the peer review process, which is an independent assessment to confirm the SEUS ARD product level and if it's a threshold, threshold level or a target level. Once the product, product alignment assessment process is completed and the SEUS ARD product level is confirmed, if it's a threshold or a target level, the card data set is catalogued for promotion and easy of access for users. Thank you, Steve. So as part of the broader vision that SEALS has for analysis ready data, the SEALS ARD strategy was created last year. The strategy reflects the work that the LSIVC team has been doing on the card for l initiative. And it also acknowledges the need to expand the work in seals beyond the product family specifications and also beyond the land domain. The ARD strategy for seals is based around four pillars. The first pillar of this strategy is the seals ARD user needs and specifications. The development of ARD specifications is central to the CEO's ARD work. And in order for this initiative to succeed, any future development of ARD specifications must consider user needs. A third production and access of ARD products is the second pillar of this strategy. It's critical to make sure that data discovery, data access, and data integration is a priority so users can make the most of the CEO's ARD standards. Pilots and feedback is the third pillar for the strategy. And the strategy proposes several pilots and tasks, but one of the main objectives of this pillar is to collect lessons learned to be used to improve the ARD specifications and delivery methods of platforms such as ODC and Digital Earth Africa. And the last pillar is, uh, of the strategy is communication and promotion, which SEALS has been doing uh, through different channels, including this webinar. So uh, for more details on the SEALS ARD strategy, uh, you can go to the SEALS ARD webpage and you can see the webpage in my slide. Thank you, Steve. So having in mind the SEALS ARD strategy, we developed a one-year roadmap, which is based around the four pillars of the strategy. The 2020 roadmap covers activities related to the ARD specifications and user needs, including the development of new product family specifications. And of course, the annual review cycle of the previous specifications. Uh, the development of new specifications, such as the polarimetric radar, and the newly uh, planned aquatic reflectance PFS are based on established user needs and priorities. The roadmap addresses the third component of, of the SEALS ARD framework, agency self-assessment and the peer review process. USGS and the European Space Agency carried out their formal self-assessment for their optical products. And this uh, self-assessments are currently being peer reviewed the roadmap considers the commercial engagement in the CEO's ARD initiative and how the commercial sector may play different roles as data users, data providers, data hosts, or uh, as providers of processing chains to produce data that meet CEO's ARD specifications. 
we have already had several discussions with industry to understand their views. A paper has been produced looking at how CEOs needs to engage efficiently with the private sector to take the CEOs ARD to the, to the next level. The views and input from the private sector and, uh, on how LSIVC and SEALs should approach the broader community and the commercial sector are crucial for the success of the SEALs Analysis Ready Data Initiative. The roadmap includes the development of the SEALs Interoperability Terminology Report, which intends to consistently discuss and provide examples of key terms such as um, ARD, card parallel, harmonized products, and so on. And also the roadmap envisages to establish pipelines and procedures for CEOs ARD by piloting CEOs ARD products. It's expected that Digital World Africa will provide the opportunity to trial a CEOs ARD product on a large scale and Synergize has been working with Digital Earth Africa towards the production of a radar ARD product. From Roadmap also covers the promotion side. Uh, for the last three years or so, SEALS has been promoting uh, the work on SEALS ARD through different channels, including publishing materials on the SEALS ARD webpage running sessions, presenting and participating at multiple conferences, uh, as well as publishing uh, papers in conferences and, and uh, conference All these efforts have been um, successful and served as the motivation for us to organize this webinar today. Thank you. And my last slide is on the card parallel examples. USGS Collection Tool, Landsat 8 Level 2 Surface Reflectors, is an example of uh, SEALS Analysis Ready Data. USGS, as I mentioned before, has already gone through the formal self-assessment, and the expectation is that results from the peer review will be made available very soon in the SEALS ARD webpage. We can see the same situation with the Level 2 uh, 2A surface reflectors product from uh, the European Space Agency, uh, Sentinel 2. Results from the peer review process will also be made available very soon to the user community. And finally, uh, the expectation is that JAXA ALUS 2 and POSA 2 polarimetric decomposition and normalized radar backscatter products will be also CUS ARG compliant data sets. JAXA is planning to undertake the formal self assessment very soon. And with that, I finalize my talk. Um, many thanks for your attention, and I would like to invite our next speaker, Steve Laban. Thank you, Andrea, and welcome, everyone. Uh, again, my name is Steve Laban. I'm with the U.S. Geological Survey and also one of the CIOS LSIVC co-chairs, along with my uh, dear friends and colleagues, uh, Zolti and Adam. Uh, adoption of the CSARD and the card for all framework, which Andrea just mentioned, has several key advantages uh, for three broad groups, which we have defined as follows. First, uh, data producers. These are the people who actually generate the products. Data distributors uh, are the second group. These are the people who provide these products to the end users. And then finally, a uh, number three are the data users. These are the people who actually are using the products. Uh, these groups are not intended to be viewed as individual silos, and you may identify with being part of more than one of these groups. So first of all, from a data producer's perspective, from an increased um, uptake perspective, uh, data analysis, statistics, and machine learning all are being made easier through the availability of free and open programming modules and tools, and data producers must also take steps to ease um, this uh, availability of data for consistent and predictable framework um, to be able to do that. On the increased uh, impact, uh, new and emerging users of satellite data benefit greatly from assistance with pre-processing and data preparation, making data easier to access and use will increase its impact and accelerate the growth of this user base. 
from a relevance perspective, if data are not available for use straight away, it may be left behind. For continued relevance, data should be easy to use, easy to access, and fit seamlessly into workflows and future data architectures. CIOS ARD can contribute to optimizing the use of viable resources as well. For example, instead of having highly skilled scientists doing basic pre-processing -proce pre work, they can better focus their efforts on performing good science. And finally, um, CIOS ARD enables interoperability. It's a starting point for this with data and information from other data producers. The integration and combination of consistent and comparable data provides new avenues for analysis, greatly increasing information density. Next, from a data distributor's perspective, CSARD can provide a broad range of analysis-ready data products that are ready to use and that can all be hosted within the same environment, let's say a cloud environment, making that platform very appealing to customers. Consistent and high quality data sets are available using CIOS ARD framework, which makes life easier for users and greatly increases the amount of analytics that can be performed. The integration and combination of CIOS ARD provides these new avenues for analysis. Now finally, from a data user's perspective, even sophisticated users of Earth observation data typically invest a large portion of their effort into data preparation, sometimes even up to 80%. This is a major barrier to full and successful utilization of space-based data. As data volumes grow, this barrier is becoming more significant for all users. Data producers invest significant amounts of time and effort making sure data is as good as it can be. So as an end user, you can capitalize on this knowledge and expertise for your applications, ensuring quality and accuracy by using CIOS ARD datasets. CIOS ARD also minimizes costs. Data processing can be costly and pre-processed datasets reduce these costs. Again, the integration combination of consistent and comparable data pro provides new avenues for analysis and greatly increases information density for applications such as time series analysis, which Adam talked about earlier. Again, all of this information and more can be found on our CIOS ARD website, http colon slash slash cios.org slash ARD. And with that, um, we'd like to be able to answer as many questions as possible in the time remaining. Again, questions can be submitted via uh, Slido. The information is there on your screen, www.sli.do. The event code is CIOSARD, again, uh, not case sensitive. And should there be any questions we cannot address in this allotted time, we will plan to follow up with you via email and again, as Zolti mentioned, your questions and feedback will help shape future CIOS ARD webinars within the next couple of months. So with that, we will take questions and we'll have Matt, uh, the lead our secretariat, help us with that. Hi everybody, thanks Steve. Um, yes, so we've had some good questions come through. Uh, the first one here is from Arnold Holland from PCI Geomedics. And uh, the question is, is the session today being recorded? And uh, I can answer that one. Yes, it is. Uh, it will be available at this same link that you use to access the live stream. It will be archived there. Secondly, uh, Ignacio Borlaf asked, uh, is there a product family specification mm -hmm. for interferometric radar? Um, perhaps Andrea, direct that one to you. Yes, thanks, Matt. Yes, there is. Um, and uh, there is a SAR uh, subgroup uh, working on that currently. Great. And I'll just add, I saw that uh, the lead of that SAR subgroup, OK Rosenquist, um, wrote back in the Slido that uh, the PFS is under development and the plan is to endorse it in the first quarter of 2021. <clears throat> 
Yeah, the next question is from Yvonne Petitfeu from ISA. Um, the question is, do we have the names and affiliations of everybody on the webinar today? Uh, yes, everybody registered. So uh, we have a pretty comprehensive list and uh, we'll be using that list to uh, contact everybody and, and uh, send the uh, link for this recording and a little bit of a transcript as well. M. Abdullah from uh, Not Specified asks, how is your work related to the geo essential variables work? Um, Adam, would you be able to answer that one? Uh, yeah, thanks, Matt. I can do that. Um, I just know there's a number of questions coming in that are getting shuffled up the order, Matt, as people vote for them. But in terms of the essential variables, the analysis ready data is a, is a pre-step. Uh, so it's getting the satellite data to the point where they can be used broadly and would then be used to derive essential variables so that your supply chain from satellite to, send to essential variable is robust and has that analysis ready data step in it. I'd note that we're also working with groups like GeoGlam who, who are evolving things like agricultural essential variables or uh, and that's a similar case where the, the critical variables they're looking for um, would be derived from analysis ready data. Thanks, Adam. The next question is from Siri Jodha Kalsa. And uh, it is, how does the community at large become involved in defining or reviewing the ARD product family specifications? Uh, Andrea? Um, well, um, we are trying to involve more and more uh, the community. For, for instance, we had um, the first call for an aquatic reflectance for the frame lift specifications uh, last week. And we tried to reach as many uh, people as possible, uh, experts. So um, yeah, that's how we are trying to, 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 to put people together to to talk and to decide what the specification should be. I guess now that we have this list of people that are clearly interested in the concept, maybe we could start sending um, information notes out to the, the emails we've collected. Yeah, that's that's a very good idea, Matt. Thank you. Great. Thanks. Okay, a question here from Ed Armstrong, and uh, he asks, for the ARD prototypes, are you focusing on a particular processing level? Um, I'm not sure who to direct that to. Uh, any of the leads? Uh, Matt, I can have a shot at that. I, mean, I think uh, I mean, ARD is essentially, uh, I think, a level two type product. And actually, perhaps Steve should answer that because he's most closely associated with production. Yeah, thank you, Adam. That's exactly what I would uh, suggest as well. Uh, our specifications uh, up to this point have been uh, pretty consistent with the level two uh, definitions, and that's why you'll see um, so far the uh, self-assessments that have come in um, against those uh, product family specifications from the USGS are our level two surface reflectance and surface temperature products, as well as the ESA level 2A uh, surface reflectance product. Um, yeah, that's it, Matt. Thanks, Steve. Adam. Next is uh, from Joan Masso. Uh, can we get access to the CIOS interoperability terminology draft report? Uh, we are working on a report on ARD concept, on the ARD concept, and uh, it could be a good use, um, good to use the same definitions in that report. Uh, Steve, I know you've been working this with the uh, working group on information systems in CIOS. Yeah, thank you, Matt. Exactly. Um, within the land surface imaging virtual constellation, we did prepare an initial draft of definitions. And um, we are now working across 
broader um, CIOS agency groups through what Matt just described, a group we call WIGIS. Um, that group is forming um, the final terminology paper. It's in draft. Um, it's my understanding that group um, is doing an internal peer review um, right now or soon will be. Uh, the target would be for us to have something available and endorsed um, later this year in the uh, September, October timeframe. Okay. Again, I think we can take an action to get that out to everybody once it's endorsed. You bet. Yep. Okay. Uh, Nicolina Milevas from the University of Augsburg. Uh, is there more precise information when the ALOS2 PALSAR2 data will become freely available? Um, I'm not sure if anybody on the call can answer that one. Um, well, um, Matt, if I may, the card for l doesn't necessarily mean that uh, the data will be free. It's not our decision. It's not CEO's decision. It's the provider's decision. Um, so while you can have ALOS 2 PASA 2 as a card for L format, um, it's not necessarily will be free. This is really a decision of JAXA. While we have Landsat, uh, Sentinel 2, where the governments or the agencies decided to have it free. Absolutely. I think we have some colleagues from JAXA in the slider, so um, they might be able to put an answer in there about the data availability side of things, possibly. Next question, Alba Sanchez. Uh, is ARD intended to become a data format such as NetCDF, um, are W3C or OGC involved in ARD specifications? Um, so Mike. Pass that one to you again. I know you've been involved yeah. on that side. Um, so while we are not really looking at a specific data format, actually, so the question is really good in terms of you are asking about data format, but also if, if we are going through some sort of uh, um, standardization uh, procedure. Um, so we will not necessarily say that uh, a card for L has to be uh, uh, some sort of uh, data format. Generally, most agencies in the optical sector, at least, they are providing uh, the data as GeoTIFF now. But we are fully open of other data formats. And uh, browsing through the questions, I see someone as was asking about stack or uh, cloud optimized GeoTIFF. Um, these are all fitting within the CART for L uh, framework. Now. Uh, regarding uh, if we are working with some organizations, actually we do. Um, we looked into a standardization procedure uh, as well. Um, and as of now, we are working with, in fact, OGC in the, uh, their ongoing testbed 16 um, ARD um, work, where at least at LSIBC's aim to kind of create a community standard, if you will, um, which we can call card for l Thanks. Could I just add a little to that, uh, Zolti, going back to the, the data format um, question, we made a conscious decision to not um, look to standardize on a data for particular data format when we initiated this work. We're now at the point where we might start to at in, include under the framework some guidance on different data formats uh, where the community is evolving a preference for a particular data format. And we are seeing stack and Colgus formats that are being favoured in the optical area. Thank you. So the next question, uh, Jean Beaufort. Uh, can you please provide information on the peer review process for software providers um, that are aiming to develop uh, software that generates card for l So is there any guidance available in that regard? I can answer that. Matt, I can try. Um, we uh, still don't have a 
guideline for um, for the industry uh, for like software providers. But uh, that's one of the main reasons that we are um, engaging with industry and it's part of our roadmap is to identify how we are going to proceed with the peer review for in particular for for the commercial side. Matt, this is Steve. I may sure. just add as well that um, it's our intention to provide sample data sets um, on our uh, CIOS uh, ARD website. So um, other data providers can use those as, as guides and templates. Uh, if you look at the product family specifications that are currently on our website, you'll notice that the specification itself has the columns in it to do the, the self-assessment process. So uh, we're trying to facilitate an easy um, and uh, well understood process as much as we can. And that's all coming. Just a perhaps one further observation on that question. In terms of exactly how the data are produced, I mean, the specifications we talk about, about what the product should look like, not so much how it's produced. Uh, so it's about the quality of the data and having a geophysical measurement. And sometimes that goes to a particular correct approach, but not in general. Any other inputs? Okay, um, next question is from Ian Jarvis. And uh, he asks, what user needs are being used to drive uh, Sentinel-1 SAR ARD requirements? Um, I can have a first shot at this, uh, Matt. Uh, Andrea might want to follow on. But what's happening with the SAR is that the community itself, the radar community, and it's uh, uh, okay who's listening, but not on the call is the leader on this, is actually itself working out how it could produce products, interferometric products, backscatter products, according to a, a specification that would allow them to be produced systematically and, uh, and en masse in future. So it's the radar community itself, which is actually driving the specification. Um, and so in fact, they are representing, if you like, their users in terms of what, what the ARD products could be uh, and technically whether they're feasible and how they could be produced. Thanks, Adam. Question from Sudhir uh, asks, uh, EO ARD can be large and sometimes not easy to download. Is there any plan in place to serve those ARD as web services that can be consumed without download? I can I can try to answer that, Matt. Um, so, yeah, as as we mentioned, trial data sets will be sourced through the ARD website. Um, but yeah, it's a very relevant question: how to actually get a uh, a big load of data, even just one Sentinel-2 scene, it, it hits you back with a, a large amount of data in terms of downloading. So our aim is to work with the providers as well. So once data will become card for l and it's coming already from the data producers, the data providers will be providing that data in a card for l format. So if you go to I don't want to commercialize the place, but you go to the big uh, commercial um, distributors, eventually you will be getting through your cloud access card for air data. Um, as, as we can see, uh, the Landsat uh, collection number, collection two, and the new, the upcoming reprocessing of Sentinel-2 will actually start to provide data in card for l So once you find it on any of the cloud services, that's what you will get. Anyone else? Well, sounds like you have it. 
Thanks, Zolti. Uh, a question from Francis Lindsay of NASA um, about whether these slides from today will be available. And uh, I'll say yes, we can get those around to everybody. Next is uh, Feng Yin. Uh, is there a quality assurance of the peer review, or is it better to have operational validation schemes to continuously validate and improve the ARD data set? So uh, our peer review uh, expert, um, Med Harvey Vankapan from Geoscience Australia. We don't have him on the line, but uh, uh, maybe Andrea, do you? Sorry. Could I I'll comment on this, Matt, if you like? Uh, there's ongoing work to. Um, sorry, I lost the question now. <laughs> it's okay. Is there a quality assurance of the uh, peer review process? Or is it? Um... So we have a peer review process in terms of assessing whether the data fit the specifications, and we're increasingly seeing effort going into, and certainly Digital Earth Africa, and I know the Australian teams are looking at independent measurements and field tests to test the quality of the data, the absolute quality, and to provide that as feedback to the to the providers, so that not just whether they meet the specification, but the inherent quality of the data continues to improve. That's a work in progress and we, uh, uh, and I'd hope that other people in the community will really engage with that as well. Yeah, I just want to, to complement that um, the peer review uh, process is related to the version of the, the document. So if, um, improvements happen uh, in the future. So it means that uh, the data set, um, it's going to be always linked to that version. So the improvements may be, uh, they have to, to be transferred to the data sets, if you know what I mean. Um, it, there will be always a link between the version of the document and the data set. Could I also, at this point, Matt, Matt, just flick back to Francis Lindsay's question from NASA, which goes not to just about the data sets, but also about let's show how improvements to interoperability are achieved through ARD. Um, I'll make the first comment is that if you look at how those interoperability works are progressing in cases like the harmonizing Landsat and Sentinel with um, uh, which NASA has been leading, then uh, the steps that are taken in that um, which involve things like corrections and bringing the data together are similar to the steps that are taken in, in the ARD framework. So there's a series of corrections which are needed before you can do that uh, merging and integration and ultimately blending of, of products. So we have that example. Uh, there are multiple examples in places like Australia where they've been doing these levels of corrections um, themselves uh, and they relate to things like normalized wetness indexes which you can use to extract coastlines don't work uh, unless you do all these corrections um, now what we need to do is continue to build this the the examples um, that make a difference uh, of where this makes a difference and we're really interested to hear from the community at large about the benefits and impacts of using the ARD process data um, so that we can continue to, um, so that we can present the value of the, of the work. Can I, can I add uh, just one sentence here, Adam? Um, so how I think how we see this within LSI, we see is it's CART for l is basically as in, the initiator towards uh, a fully harmonized or actually at the end a fused data set. So we have actually this internal scale that we use that after CAR4L uh, we have something called interoperable data, then we have harmonized data sets and eventually we have uh, uh, fusions where at the really last stage um, you don't actually 
really know what sensor you are working with. I mean, you can know it if you want, but it's not very relevant because the sensors are fully uh, fused. So uh, ESA has a, a, a prototype project uh, working with the uh, Landsat 8 and Sentinel-2 A and B data where they fully harmonize um, the data sets. Okay. Uh, Jonas Sobrell from the German Aerospace Center asks, uh, will there be guidelines available with information how to produce ARD formats, um, for example, the radar backscatter, um, with different kinds of software? I could answer if 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 it's okay. Um, so actually, and this is this is why we have, among other things, the this webinar um, to reach out not only to the big data providers, um, and and this is relevant for the next question from Fabian as well, uh, where he's asking who is uh, producing these data sets. Um, so it's not that we only work with the largest data producers. So we are looking out to work with data, smaller data providers uh, and also software developers. So I can mention that we already work with the PCI Geomatica from Canada. They were interested to tune up their software um, to be able to provide a card for our data. So I'm not sure where they are at this point, but I know that they are working on that. And to coming back to, to the data distribution itself, again, our aim is that not only ESA or USGS or JAXA will provide card for our data, but also the, the business community and the, the smaller providers who will be able to pick up the card for our idea and provide their data actually in a card for our format. And Zulti, maybe I'll add a couple comments too, that um, it is a requirement um, for card for l um, com compliance that the uh, algorithm description documentation is all provided um, publicly and on a, on a website available to anybody. So we will be working as these data sets are, are published and become uh, registers card for l compliant, we'll be ensuring that all that information and I know, for instance, um, the USGS does also provide its uh, software um, source code for um, producing uh, level two products um, uh, to the public as well for going from level one to level two uh, to do that processing. So uh, that is part of the requirements of, of the product family specifications themselves. So Andrea, we have two questions here about the self-assessment process and uh, how one would undertake that for a product. Can you give us a high level overview of what doing a self-assessment means? Um, well, self-assessment is when um, the data providers or the agencies, they have a product and they want to see if the, their product is at, at, at the field ARD level. So um, the first step is to contact the LSI VC secretary um, and get uh, further information. Uh, but we have uh, at the CUS uh, ARD webpage, we have the, the uh, product family specifications and all the parameters are in there, all the requirements. So that's the, the, the broad overview of the self-assessment. And the peer review is, uh, I don't know if there is a question on that, but um, the peer review is when an independent uh, group um, peer review uh, the level uh, of the self-assessment because the PFS has two levels, the threshold level, that's the minimum requirement uh, to be a COZRD, and the target level when it involves a more elaborated um, like additional requirements. Uh, so this peer review uh, at the moment is the working group Calval um, who is doing the peer review for USGS and the European Space Agency for their optical products and we still have to define how we are going to proceed with uh, the industry, uh, the commercial um, products. 
we still don't have a process, a peer review process for the, the commercial side. Thank you. Thanks, Andrea. Sanji asks, um, how does CIOS ARD address um, interoperability and, and the use of multi-sensor data? So for instance, using Sentinel-2 and Lineset-8 uh, without calibration. Steve, uh, I know you've been doing interoperability work with colleagues in ESA. Um, any response on that one? Yeah, I was, um, Matt, can you, can you point me at that question again? That one slipped off my screen as well. Sure. Can you repeat that? Yep. Uh, so Sanji asks, uh, in the context of CIOS ARD, will this also aim to enable the direct analysis using multi-sensor data, for instance, uh, Sentinel-2 and Lineset-8 without calibration? Yeah, I, I would say um, the aim is to um, promote and and uh, establish that initial stage of interoperability and, and Zolti kind of addressed that earlier and how we view it being a continuum. Now, to get to a beginning state of card Pharrell, there is uh, requirements that go into uh, creating a level two product. So. Uh, assuming you've reached that level of uh, quality and consistency in your product, um, then it would fully enable uh, further interoperability with um, other adjustments that might be needed, like um, spectral bandpass adjustments and those kind of things and corrections that Adam mentioned earlier. Thanks. So in terms of that interoperability, I think that the parallel I draw is that if if the ARD from Sentinel-2 and from Landsat-8 is, is both producing a measurement of surface reflectance, then they're inherently more comparable than, than if you weren't doing that. But they're different instruments. So just as if you measured temperature with a different instrument, you might get a different reading due to time fluctuations or some such. Uh, you'd expect them to be different and need further work. but but starting from a, a good place. Thanks, Matt. Thanks. Tushar Shukla asks, um, what is the current plan for progression towards the stack format? All right, let me just respond to that one, Matt, perhaps. Um, we're not actively promoting that uh, stack format. Um, the uh, what we're doing is simply noting that the community is progressing uh, for stack and associated formats like COG. And if the community starts to use those more broadly, we might include some guidance on how the data could be produced to support those. Okay, next question. Uh, Roberto uh, asks, as DS are data providers uh, for CAP monitoring, uh, we found out each PA has its own ARD format and processing preference. Can CIOS PFS be considered a proposal for a standard? This goes to a couple of questions along the same line. We have considered whether or not uh, we should look at this as a standard. Uh, at the moment, we're in the position of thinking that if we can bring on a broader community, then it might be something that's uh, a community-owned standard before we were to look at taking the deep dive of going to a formal standard. As Zolti mentioned earlier, we're working with the OGC um, on, on this, uh, and we're just going to see where that takes us. I hope that answered the question. Thanks, Adam. So we have two questions here about 
how does a an organization become a distributor of card for all data? Can I can I answer here? Mm -hmm. um, well, actually, it's it's very simple. Uh, it depends what what kind of organization you are. If you are a data producer, you will just start to follow the PFSs and process your data into card for l So that's one thing. If you are a data provider, you just pay attention when you harvest your data and make sure that your data producer will provide provide their data in card for l Now, the other option is, of course, that if the data provider will not provide it in card for l uh, the data produce uh, uh, data sorry the data producer will not provide it but the data provider can reprocess that data of course given that you have whatever you need for that uh, and provide your data eventually in card for l that's that's the simple answer i don't know if the other colleagues have anything to add here i think there's different models about how people can get involved Salty. So we, we will see some. Uh, I mean, the agencies produce card for all data, which means that anybody can potentially host it. Um, there are some groups who will produce their own ARD, hopefully to, to the specification, and some private companies that will produce data to the specification. So it's it, it's an ecosystem that's evolving. Uh, I'm not sure that we can be more specific about than that. Okay, thank you. Next question is from Andrea Baraldi from the Italian Space Agency. Uh, why does card for all require atmospheric correction exclusively? Uh, ignoring adjacency effect correction, topographic effect correction, and BRDF corrections. Could I pick that one up then? Mm -hmm. Uh, I think uh, the objective of the card for l that you're talking about is is to get to a measurement of surface reflectance. Uh, at the moment, uh, the community is agreed that atmospheric correction is part of that and and, and is converging on methods to do that. Uh, whereas topographic correction and BRDF are more contentious uh, and haven't yet gained universal support for them being required uh, and uh, and partly that's tied in with clarity on the methods to do them. So what we'll see over time is, as Andrea mentioned, there's a, a uh, there's two levels in the card for L. One is a, a least requirements, the least needs to be done, and the other is a target which is which is pushing to be uh, better. And that's we'll see the quality improve as more as there becomes a convergence agreement on the necessary corrections uh, and how they can be made. Um, so there are people who, whose view is very strongly that BRDF correction is required. There are others who, who are less convinced. If you have a very narrow field of view sensor, then it may not be required uh, in any case. So it's a progression um, and we'll see the specifications will become more, will raise a higher bar as the community identifies that a higher bar is needed. Adam, I might just add as well, in the latest version of the surface uh, reflectance, surface temperature, um, product family specifications, version 5.0, which has just been published in the last few weeks, um, uh, BRDF correction, train illumination been added as, uh, as a separate uh, target level requirements. So that is that is part of the specifications going forward. Okay, so um, it's really great to see we've got heaps of questions. Um, so we'll be able to take two more on the stream and uh, we will endeavor to answer the rest via email. Um, and uh, we'll send those out to the full list of registrations that we had for the webinar.
Um, so two more. Uh, one here from Gary Holmes. Um, what's the likely time scale um, for the systematic availability of ARD for Landsat 8, 9, and Sentinel 2? Um, Steve? Yep, I can, uh, for I can for sure answer Landsat 8 and 9. Uh, let uh, perhaps uh, Andre or Zolti do the Sentinel 2 one. Um, the Landsat 8 uh, product um, being card for all compliant is going through its final testing um, phases right now. We are moving to a, a cloud enabled environment and we see that um, in the next um, just few months here. So we've we've uh, communicated a, a mid 2020 uh, uh, date on our website and it'll be towards the end of that um, that time window. Uh, Landsat 9, of course, is yet to be launched. That'll be launched next year, and those products will be generated out of the gate, um, being card for all compliance. So that'll be next year. Um, I'll let uh, Zolti or Andrea maybe address Sentinel 2. Yeah, I can I can say a few words about Sentinel 2, although I'm not ESA. Um, they are working heavily just like USGS actually um, to reach a card for a compliance with the uh, Sentinel 2 as of now. Um, I can't really say uh, if Andrea is back, uh, maybe she can say a date if what she heard. Um, and we also work uh, with the uh, Sentinel 1 towards a radar backscatter card for l um, Just to add here one more thing, uh, I think there was one other question. Um, um asking about um uh, when a new gri uh, or the new dm will be involved when we are generating a, a sentinel 2 card for l um so actually by the time I, I foreseen that by the time when the 30 meter copernicus dm will be incorporated into the sentinel 2 workflow isa will be generating just uh, as uh, Steve said, out of the gate, uh, card for l um, compliant uh, products. I'm not sure if Andrea is back and uh, she has anything to add here. Zolti Adam here. I'd like to just add in an ob observation that for Africa, Digital Earth Africa is actually um, developing and, and funding pipelines of analysis ready data from Sentinel 2 using the Sen2 core. Um, methodology, but also, and this was alluded to earlier, uh, prototyping uh, Sentinel-1 rate normalized radar backscatter product. Uh, and the reason we're doing that is to try to both demonstrate the need, we can see the need, uh, and to identify what it will look like as as uh, ESA hopefully um, steps in to pick up those those supply chains. And Zolti, maybe perhaps to um, um, pick up off your GRI comment uh, with Landsat Collection 2, uh, we've been working closely with ESA and uh, have, have um, reprocessed and used um, uh, updated ground control to um, take advantage of GRI. So with Collection 2 and once uh, ESA processes um, using GRI, we expect those two products will align within the order of uh, five to seven meters. Uh, we've done a lot of analysis on that working with uh, ESA. I think this also leads to Dave Small's question about will ARD products be reprocessed with se sequential collections um, as improved reference data sets and ancillary data sets come in? And I think. This is ultimately a question for the for the agencies providing the data, but increasingly it leads the work towards a collections-based approach. Yeah, and and to and to touch on that even further, maybe Adam, we are also working with um, ESA on uh, Copernicus Dem uh, again. Um, that's that's not in collection two. We are progressing forward on that. Um, without that, but um, perhaps uh, collection three uh, will will have a common dem.
Okay. So uh, one final question, and uh, I think I can answer this one. Um, it's from Sergio Falco, and he asks, uh, do we have a final version of the product dummy specifications uh, at this point? And uh, the answer is that we update them annually, um, and uh, it's a continual process. We expect them to be ever-evolving. And uh, the latest were just endorsed by CIOS, and uh, they're on our website at cios.org forward slash ARD. Uh, currently version 5 of all of them, and you can get them there. So with that, um, we do have many more questions. Uh, as I said, we'll, um, we'll get answers to all of them and uh, send them back to you via email. Um, otherwise, I think we will wrap up the stream. I want to thank everybody for joining. Sure. And, uh, so I think it was really good. Quick open mic. Um, sure. Thanks everybody for joining. It's really been great to have this level of interest. It, it gives us a sense that the work we're doing really is relevant and important. Uh, and that we we can look forward to future webinars. We'll use some of the questions from this to help to shape what the next one will be on. Just a quick thank you from everyone. It's really was a great interest, which we are very pleased with, and we will continue working very hard to hopefully please you guys. Thank you again. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. So the stream okay. archive will be at this link. Um, feel free to rewatch it if you like, and uh, we'll be in touch. Bye all. Bye bye.